Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for consideration is found recorded in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when I grew up, or was, when I was growing up, I actually grew up on a farm, a hog farm. Oh, I helped milk cows for my uncle, but it was pretty much a hog farm, and we were one of the biggest farms, and, and in fact had over 130 sows farrowing um, every other day. And one of my jobs as part of chores was to go and take out the dead animals. So I saw my share of literally blood and guts. And so it always surprises me when I hear someone who says they can't handle blood and guts. And, and, and I actually got a pastor friend who, who I didn't know didn't like going hunting and fishing because his number one reason was he can't stand the sight of blood even his own sight of blood. By the way, his wife's a nurse. And that just blew my mind. Especially because he wouldn't have made a good priest. Because a priest, his job was to take those sacrifices and, and to end that animal. He was to cut it up into pieces and, and then they went to the water basins and he would wash it up and put it on the altar depending on what kind of sacrifice you were offering. These sacrifices were a constant reminder that it would require the shedding of blood in order to be saved. But it would also mean that it would require a substitute to take your place because you could not shed that blood and live. And that's what those sacrifices constantly, all day long, six days a week, that's what it was from six in the morning till six at night. And so when we hear of Jesus being the high priest, he's a high priest that is truly like no other. In fact, the opening verses here to the letter to the Hebrews really reminds us that it is proper to call Jesus the great high priest. Now, the writer to the Hebrews says, we don't know who is the author. And in fact, we're not even told to whom is he writing. But it is pretty clear as you read the letter that he is writing to a group of, of Jewish people who are actually Christians, but they're tempted to go back to their Jewish religion. Christianity is being persecuted at this time. Christian, Christians are being put to death. Their land and homes and, and property is being confiscated. And they are even losing their jobs and their wealth. And so the temptation to go back to the Jewish religion and to go back to the old covenant looked pretty appealing. But the writer to the Hebrews says, don't go back to the Old Covenant because the Old Covenant is fulfilled. We're no longer under the Old Covenant. That agreement that was made with Moses and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. Remember the covenant? You, be, you follow my commands and I will be your God and you will be my people. But now, Jesus fulfilled that Old Covenant. So we live under a New Covenant and the New Covenant it's a, it's a one-sided agreement that through faith in Jesus, we are saved. And because of that, the writer to the Hebrews couldn't emphasize enough that this Jesus and the covenant he established and the covenant you even enjoy when you partake of the Lord's Supper, remember, this is the blood of the new covenant, is this Jesus is superior. Going back to it makes no sense. 
And so it was like the writer to the Hebrews is so excited about getting into the matter that he doesn't write who is writing and to whom is he writing. He goes with this profound statement. He says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. All those Old Testament prophets, they all held a piece of the puzzle. And when you put the puzzle all together and took all their pieces, it showed that it was the picture of Jesus. Those were like fingerprints, all those Old Testament prophecies, and they matched Jesus perfectly. But he came to them in various ways, and he came to many different uh, people over a period of time. But in the last days, with the coming of the Son of God, with the coming of Jesus, there would be no new revelation. He would bring the revelation because he brought the fulfillment. There would be no new ways of, of coming with the message. The message would be written and it would be proclaimed. And we have the privilege of reading that written message. It is the Bible. And once again, we're not expecting another revelation. We're not expecting God to come to us in any other way than through the Holy Word. Because the Word is the Word of the Son. This is the Son of God. And Jesus is the Son of God. He's not Son of God in the sense that He's one believer among many. He's not the Son of God in the sense that He's the child of God. He is the Son of God because He is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is true God. And if you're confused, the writer to the Hebrew reminds his readers that he is the heir of all things. That means he is the owner of it all. He created everything by His almighty Word. And he created it out of nothing. When he created man, he made him from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. When he made the woman, he made her from Adam's rib. That was his body. What a beautiful thing that he has done. In fact, through him all things were made. He's the agent. If he's not involved, then there's no creation. He is the creator. And that very word that was used to create everything out of nothing is the very word that the writer to the Hebrew reminds us, sustains us. Science is still trying to figure out how this world holds together. We already have the answer. It is God who holds it together. And it is the Son of God who created all things. He is the representation of God's glory. And remember at that sacred mountain when he transfigured himself in all his glory before Peter, James, and John, he shone that he was the true Son of God. In fact, everything he does, he does to the glory of God, carrying out the Father's plan. And the Father's plan was to save the world by the sending of his Son. He is the he is the essence of God. And therefore, all the attributes, all the divine attributes would be taken into his human nature. He is fully God and fully man in one person. Not half God and half man. That's Hercules. He's fully God and fully man in one person. But he is the Son of God. When we look at the cross of Christ, I pray that's what you see. Your God is dying for you. Your God is paying for your sins and paying for them in full. And yet, there are many who deny Jesus. And just as bad, there are millions upon millions who reject who he truly is. They refuse to believe that he is the Son of God because they refuse to believe that God can die for us. Remember, he 
did not make full and constant use of his divine power and glory. He didn't give it up, but he didn't make full and constant use of it when he died on the cross. And because he is the Son of God, the salvation and the sacrifice that he made for our sins would count for everyone and for all times. And this is why it's so important that our Savior be fully God and fully man in one person. No other Savior would work. That makes Jesus the only one. The only one who offered himself for the purification of sin. We call him a great high priest because he's the son of God. But we call him the great high priest because he was a priest like no other. He was the priest who could purify us, who could cleanse us of our sins, who could win for us and did the forgiveness of sins. This is the Savior that has won the victory for us all. Here, our sins deserve the punishment of God's wrath. It deserves the punishment of hell itself. And yet, Jesus suffered that all for us and gave us the victory by giving us the forgiveness of sins. It is God's gift to us, and his invitation is believe it. And even that faith is a gift of God. That moves your hearts to accept what your Savior has done. The purification of sins reminds me of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which happened once a year. This was the big celebration, by the way. Just as big, if not bigger, than the Passover. The Day of Atonement was the day when the priest would offer, the high priest that is, would offer a sacrifice for his sins, and then he would offer a sacrifice for the sins of, his, of the people. And on that day, he would actually collect the blood of, from the sacrifices, and he would go into the most holy place. Remember, the, the temple was divided into two parts. There was the holy place, made up two-thirds, but the most holy place only had one piece of furniture in it. Only the high priest went in it once a year. They would actually smoke up the room and clean it out. And when the priest would finally go in with his bucket of blood, he would go and sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant. The cover of the Ark of the Covenant was called the mercy seat or the atonement cover. And, and he would sprinkle that for the, for the purification of sins. In fact, everything, we're told, was always sprinkled in blood. You remember Moses even establishing the Old Covenant? Oh, he would collect the blood and he would sprinkle it on all the people. Everything was always with the shedding of blood. Because it would require blood from the Son of God to save us and purify us of all our sins. And you are forgiven. You are cleansed because of this sacrifice, which, by the way, was made once and for all. The Old Testament sacrifices were made over and over, but the New Covenant, one and done. It was complete. All the Old Testament sacrifices actually pointed to the new sacrifice or to the sacrifice that Jesus made. And this sacrifice we know is complete because we're told by the writer to the Hebrews that the Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. See, his resurrection reminds us he's God. His resurrection is proof that our sins are paid for. His resurrection is proof that we have life after death. But his ascension back into heaven is proof that there was no more work to be done here. Because if Jesus remained, we would always wonder, is he still doing more work? But it was done. There would not be a heaven here on earth. He would ascend to heaven with the promise to return again on the last day and take all believers with him to the glories of heaven. And therefore, my friends, don't rob Jesus of his glory and fall into the sinful trap which Satan would love you to think that you need to earn your way to heaven. By the good works that, that you do, you can, you can certainly earn God's favor and, and, and be able to get to heaven. 
when in actuality our salvation is not based on what we do. It's based on what Christ has done. It's based on the fact that our salvation is a gift from God. If our salvation is based on what we do, then we're going to live each and every day wondering, did I do enough? Did I try enough? Did I mean it enough? When in actuality, Jesus did it all. Your consciences are clear, my friends, because the price has been paid. The guilt is gone because Jesus gave his life for you all. And so we don't refer to Jesus as simply a priest or simply a high priest. We call him by the name he truly deserves, our great high priest. And there is no one greater. Amen.